panel discussion on the subject, does global capitalism provide for the right incentives? I should say as a chairman that I'm really not independent and unbiased. And the reason is, I think if you look at the last few hundred years, there's no question that capitalism has transformed our world. If you looked at some statistic of GDP per capita over, say, 2,000 years, it basically goes along the bottom, the y-axis, and then with the agricultural industrial revolution in Europe and then throughout the world, suddenly GDP per capita increases and real income per capita increases everywhere. However, capitalism is not without its faults, which is why we had the rise of socialism. And then we had in Marx extreme socialism. The 20th century was the nearest thing you could have to a controlled debate in economics between two totally different systems. One in which the state was the driving force of the economy and the other in which the private sector and entrepreneurs were the driving force of the economy. <clears throat> and basically the result of that contest was that capitalism won hands down. And yet I believe that our society today, the societies in which we live, are deeply skeptical of capitalism. You look, for example, at the vote uh, that you had here in Switzerland regarding the role of shareholders uh, and compensation, or the EU Parliament's initiative to cap bonuses in banking, or the financial transactions tax. I think that people feel there are three real problems in capitalism at present. Firstly, it's a system of inherent instability of cycles, and especially financial instability. Secondly, in terms of the environment, there's questions of sustainability. And thirdly, as I mentioned after Mr. Ali Babakan's speech, inequality has been increasing in most Western countries uh, for the last 30 years. So, the question is, where are we today and in which direction should we go? And for this, the students have really provided uh, a set of questions for us. Do we have in place the right incentives in economic life, in our global institutions, our political institutions? Do we have the right incentives to ensure that there will not be another global crisis. Are our international institutions almost creating moral hazard by saying, yes, we'll bail you out? In the financial sector, do we have the right degree of regulation and the balance between regulation and free enterprise. Is regulation itself becoming too complex and a burden on our society? The critics of capitalism, by and large, they don't want to go back to state ownership, but what they've done is to transfer to regulation their dissatisfaction with the system. And then there's the sense in response to inequality, the Occupy movement, the culture of capitalism itself. Is the kind of society in which we're living one which people would describe as fair? And to help us think about that, that subject and those questions, uh, we have four uh, very distinguished panelists. On my immediate uh, left is uh, Ali Babakan, who I think I've already introduced, so no need to introduce him. Uh, next to him uh, is Michael Noonan, making a pilgrimage following St. Gall to St. Gallen, 
uh, as an Irishman, to an Irishman. Uh, he is the Minister of Finance of Ireland. Uh, he's been the leader of his party, the Fine Gael in Ireland. He's held, I think, four different, in addition, uh, cabinet positions. Uh, and uh, he is a major figure uh, in European finance. Next to him is Luke Frieden from the Grand du Duchy of Luxembourg. Um, he is the Minister of Finance, and uh, ever since he entered politics in 1994, he was very young, just 31, uh, as a Member of Parliament, he was immediately made the Chairman of the Finance Committee, Chairman of the Committee on <coughs> Constitutional Affairs, and he's the Luxembourg representative on the World Bank uh, and the uh, Asian Development Bank. And then on his uh, left and on my extreme left is Lawrence Fink, or Larry Fink, as he's, uh, I think, generally known. Uh, I said to him last night, when I introduce you, I'm going to say you're one of the rock stars of finance and banking. And he said to me, I'm not a banker. <laughs> But he's really had phenomenal success. He uh, founded uh, BlackRock, been a hugely successful uh, financial institution. He was previously with uh, First Boston. He's on numerous boards. In 2011, he was named CEO of the decade by uh, Financial News. And uh, he's been named by Barron's since, 19, since 2005 every year as uh, one of the world's best CEOs. So would you give a great welcome to the panel? <laughs> the form of the discussion is, I'm going to ask each member of the panel three or four minutes to give their personal views, not read from anything, just their personal views on the subject, and then allow some time for the panel itself to have a discussion. And then I'd like to open it up for about 20 minutes to discussion. We will finish slightly after 10 o'clock. That's partly because uh, we started after 10 o'clock. So I think I'm going to go clockwise, starting with Mr. Uh, Ali Babakan. The subject, does global capitalism provide for the right incentives? Well, uh, when we look at the economic uh, system, which is implemented in many, many countries, and when we talk about, the, 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 especially from the capitalism perspective, I think it's very, very important to have the set of right rules and also good enforcement mechanisms. And most of the time, I make a, a resemblance between Olympic Games and uh, the, the, the free market economy where companies are racing with each other. In an Olympics game, for example, for the runners of 1,000 meters, if you don't have any rules, if you don't have any lines, but if you collect just 20 people and ask them, OK, just run for 1,000 meters, and whoever wins, I'm going to give the medal to. Probably that would be a chaos. But then, by experience, there are rules in Olympics. You have the lines, you have the starting point, you have the health checks, and you have very, very detailed sets of rules so that there is a fair competition. And I think the concept of fairness and justice is going to be more and more important as we go along. And the last crisis, last economic and financial crisis, did not help either fairness or justice. Because when we look at now the major financial institutions, when we look at now sovereigns, uh, the, the smaller ones, smaller financial institutions, or smaller economies, smaller countries, are being faced with sometimes tougher rules. Sometimes they are asked to do more. Sometimes they are easier to let default, like in case of few countries or like in case of some smaller financial institutions. But for the big ones, 
whether it's a big financial institution or it's a big economy, then too big to fail concept is there. And somewhat, somehow, there are support, different kinds of support coming. And especially support from the central banks, whether it is the Fed or ECB or other national central banks, through very easy financing, they are not letting the big banks to go under. They are not letting the big countries to get into the position of default or whatsoever. But then there, are mo there is more demand for smaller ones, more restrictions, more, in a way, uh, pressure for the smaller ones. And in a way, step by step, this is going to cause an unfair competitive situation. This is valid within the Eurozone, probably. This is valid for financial sector of many uh, countries. And uh, the, as you said, the moral hazard is becoming more and more of a problem. And when we look at the long term, the incentive is if you are too big, then you can just take it easy. But then if you are small, you have to be careful. And this unfair competition is going to give an unfair advantage to large countries, large economies, and large banks over the smaller ones, which is going to uh, make the world more and more, in a way, concentrated risks, more concentrated in certain countries, certain financial institutions, and then uh, it will not be a very bright future. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael. Uh, thanks very much indeed. Uh, before I went to bed last night, I was watching television. And one of the headlines was that the number of deaths from that great tragedy in the garment factory in Bangladesh has now exceeded 400. And the owner and the manager of the factory has been arrested and are awaiting charges. There was a similar tragedy uh, just off Washington Square in the Greenwich Village area of New York in 1910. There was a multi-story garment factory. I think it was the Triangle Garment Factory, it was called. And uh, the employees were teenage girls, mostly Italian and Jewish immigrants. And there was a fire on the eighth floor. And the management practice was to lock the doors uh, to avoid unauthorized absentee absenteeism and to stop pilfering in the plant. And when the girls ran to the doors, they couldn't get out. And the fire went from the eighth floor to the ninth to the tenth, and there was no communication between the floors. So when they couldn't exit on the doors, they, they ran to the windows. And when the flames caught them, they jumped. And uh, as they came down with their skirts ablaze, they hit the pavement. And the witnesses to the event, what they remember is the sound of bodies hitting the pavement. It was you know, thud, 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 145 in all. Now, New York was run that time out of Tammany Hall, and we'd have been interested in it because it was the Irish immigrants that controlled Tammany Hall, and it was one of the most corrupt systems uh, that democracy ever threw up. But corrupt as it was, they reacted, and very quickly they introduced a whole raft of labor laws and a whole raft of health and safety laws. And that very strong trade union, uh, the New York Garment Industry Union, was founded immediately. So if capitalism goes wrong, the model is action and reaction. And very often, the reaction is very strong. Now, if you take that forward to the collapse of Lehman Brothers, you can see an action again and a reaction. And again, the system reacted, and light touch regulation was replaced by, first of all, the sacking of regulators and governors of banks, and very rigorous reg regulation supported by total changes in law, driven through parliaments all over the world, were put in, were put in place. And then, because the bankers are seen as the Praetorian Guard of capitalism, the incentives of bankers were targeted as well. And as our chairman has said, you know, when the CD4 directive from Europe was going through the European Parliament, a whole series of measures were bolted on to restrict bankers' bonuses. 
and in a country in which we are now, synonymous with sympathy and support for the financial services industry. A referendum achieved one of the biggest majorities ever at 68% to restrict bankers' bonuses. So, you know, there is always a reaction to crisis events. And the reaction is like a pendulum. And those of you familiar with the elements of physics knows that the pendulum speeds up around midpoint. The pendulum does not swing at a steady pace. The pendulum increases speed to the midpoint and then decreases. So there is a possibility now that as the pendulum swings to remove incentives, that it will swing too fast and too far, and uh, that an another problem will emerge. But Europe is dealing with it, and Ali is right. Moral hazard is central to the solution, and the concept of too big to fail has to be removed from the system. And I know from speaking to my colleagues like Luke in Europe, one of the core principles of the European Banking Union and the resolution measures that will attend it <coughs> is that nobody will be too big to fail. Mm -hmm. And that there will be a divergence between you know, the sovereign and, and, and the banking industry. Now, the model seems to be action and reaction. But wouldn't it be better if we could move ahead of the crisis? And I think there are two areas which, uh, particularly in democracies who support the capitalist system, that we have to be conscious of. There's a major emerging problem as globalization progresses in the incentives that are available to a small elite who run companies, who have very good lifestyles, and who you know, have unlimited international travel, and you contrast that with hard-working middle-class people and working-class people who can no longer get jobs. This is an emerging model in many countries now, and I think we should mark it down and not wait to be reacting to the crisis, but move to remediate it before the crisis occurs. The last point I'd like to make, again, is looking to the future. Another crisis I foresee is the wide disparity now between the wealth and the lifestyle of the elderly and the wealth and the lifestyle of young people. Young people, even the very talented young people here, must fear for their future. If they were in Spain, they certainly would. If they were across the periphery of Europe, they certainly would. Because despite their talents and despite their education, the levels of unemployment are so high now that they cannot be sanguine about their future. So there's an emerging social crisis where the incentives for the elderly and the amount of wealth in the possession of the elderly is totally out of proportion, even in families, to the wealth and income of young people. And again, if we don't want to get into a model of action and reaction, and if we try and cure problems before they call to crisis point, I think that is the second key problem I see in Europe and across the world at present. So thank you very much. Fascinating insight. <laughs> Consummate politician, Mr. Noonan. That was terrific. Luke. Thank you, Lord Griffiths. We are talking this morning about global capitalism. We know what capitalism is. We know of its advantages if we compare it to socialism. But do we really know what global capitalism is? What should it lead to? We want a free market society to have growth and prosperity in our countries. But do we achieve with global capitalism also prosperity everywhere? And I think that's the big challenge that we face as politicians. Because I think that um, politics, to a large extent, is in many of our countries local and short term. But the solutions are, in my view, global and long term. And that's why we have to find a system where all of our nations can contribute to make this capitalism work. We saw that socialism doesn't work. People need to be excellent, to strive for uh, excellence and to make profit. 
But of course, this has to be within a certain framework that makes sure that there are no damages to third parties, that there is a certain fair competition, and that we have to achieve by working together. And therefore, with all friendship and respect to the Swiss president, I must say that our view is that we cannot define those rules on a purely national basis. We have to shape a national view, but bring that into a more general international and, in the case of European countries, also European uh, concept. I was listening, and some of you did as well, last night to the um, German Minister of Foreign Affairs. He spoke about the need to strengthen Europe, the role of emerging countries, and to bring all that together. <clears throat> but we have to implement that. That means, for instance, that at the IMF, Europe should speak with one voice. Why does Germany and France do not give up their seats at the IMF and to have the Eurozone or the European Union being represented by one voice, bringing into the international debate with the emerging countries uh, the concepts that we share about um, capitalism and a context within which capitalism can work for the benefit uh, of all. So the international organizations need to play a role, and the national countries, of course, have to bring in their ideas in this context. The other thing is that I, I believe that global capitalism has a lot of benefits, but we must make sure that global capitalism works, that the cross-border dimension of businesses is not destroyed by protectionist tendencies. And I'm not sure whether Although we are arguing in favor of globalization, some of us do exactly the contrary. We need to support multinational companies. If I look at the discussions about BEPS base erosion and profit shifting, mm. I sometimes have the impression that some just want to make sure that companies are only taxed within their jurisdiction, that everything that is cross-border is suspicious, and that uh, that should be um, made very difficult, if not impossible. So we will work to make sure that <coughs> enterprises are supported also if they do cross-border activities. And therefore, it's very important that we discuss this on uh, an international level and to make sure that a level playing field is achieved between all nations, big and small, and that the multinational companies including the financial institutions, are not considered to be evil beasts somewhere that destroy prosperity, but that they are absolutely necessary if they work within a certain framework uh, to um, contribute to growth uh, and prosperity. And you mentioned uh, FTT, Lord Griffiths, some of the aspects that are being discussed right now about uh, the financial transaction tax uh, will also have a very negative impact on global growth and on cross-border activities, and that's one of the reasons uh, why Luxembourg is opposing this FTT uh, as, it, as it stands uh, right now. So global capitalism is good. We need to have a global political counterpart because it exists in the economic world. It doesn't exist yet in the political world. And we have to make sure that globalization is beneficial uh, for all uh, mankind. And that's our role also as uh, politicians. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a very important point. <laughs> Globalization is under threat, and the points you make there on cross-border activity is, I think, a very important point. Larry. First of all, it's kind of lonely up here. I'm, I'm the only true capitalist on this panel right now. Well, so, um, so I need to be. Goldman alone. Sachs would be very disappointed well, <laughs> indeed. I have to tell you. Yeah, but you're the moderator, and you know. So let me let me um, first of all thank you for having me here today. Um, when I was asked to talk about this, I started thinking about um, where we are in the pendulum, as Michael talked about it. Um, and I wanted to just bring up two words that, uh, that, in my mind, go together. That's risk and responsibility. Risk sounds totally irresponsible. The word risky has a negative connotation. taking risk in a capitalistic way <coughs> is responsible and it's indispensable. So if you're a pharmaceutical company in Switzerland, 
you have to invest billions of dollars on a single molecule that may have a 10-year period of time of going through all the research, the development, the approval process. And for those investments that could lead to new discoveries that could help mankind, it does produce, obviously, volumes of profits for that company. But for every one success story, there are tens and tens of failures. But it is at risk that capitalists take. And they're all based on judgment and research. And unfortunately, there, it is, there's a high degree of failure. Um, so they're all, this is the same type of risk that theoretically was supposed to be taking in the capital markets. And some of that was successful. And a lot of it recently was failures. Let me just talk about a couple other types of risk we take as capitalists. Some are successful, some are not. I think it's fair to say for all of us that Apple invested a lot of time and money and, and became quite successful. For those who are wear, uh, wearing the most fashionable dress or suit, we see designers trying to make some bold statements. Many of them are failures and go bankrupt. Some of them are successful and now they're stars. But this is about risk taking. As I said, it's indisputable to think that risk is truly a bad word. It is not. It is a component of what we all do. And for those societies, actually, who take less risk, those societies actually are diminished over the long term. If you follow what behavior scientists talk about, there are different societies that actually take more risk than other societies. And if you look at the societies today that are growing the fastest, and China is the number one, all behavior scientists will show Chinese will take a little more risk than almost other societies. Actually, as I said in Europe, Europe in these behavior science studies show Europeans take less risk than other societies today. And maybe that is one component why there's less growth in Europe. Um, but here I am talking about risk, and it's indisputable also. There was some bad risk taking. There was men and women who were leading companies who had no idea of the risk they were taking. Mm. There was an imbalance of understanding of that risk. And so I'm not trying to sit here and say all risk is good risk. And it is now a balance, as our politicians talked about. We need a balance. And indeed, as risk takers feel, the pendulum is swinging. There is more structure around the risk. But we should not be frightened of taking risk. I will tell you my personal story from founding BlackRock. It was for me taking risk at Credit Suisse. And I was a failure at some of that risk, but it was through that failure of risk taking that gave me the idea of risk management and BlackRock. So we all have to understand there is a process, and maybe it was my own personal pendulum, but there is this process of irresponsible risk and responsible risk. And so I'm not against regulation. I think we need more regulation. Society has earned the need for responsible uh, risk taking. And we should never allow risk-taking in any company to have any impact on society. We cannot have society bail out companies. We should have, but we should allow companies take, to take losses. We should allow companies to fail if they are irresponsible or if they were just wrong on that risk-taking. And we should allow those companies who fail be um, be uh, unwound. And we did not have that during the crisis. We had to protect companies for society's purposes. And, but we have to move on from that history. I think we've learned from that history. But, and we have to now think about how do we manage risk responsibly that protects society, but also allows failure and allows shareholders to lose all their money and allows that transmission of failure 
as Michael talked about the pendulum, is that failure that can create more long-term positive results if there is a fair and just process. Thank you very much, Larry. <clears throat> I wonder if I can ask the panel two questions. Uh, one is to do with how you see uh, the current regulation in the financial sector in terms of risk. Are we having too much? Is it the wrong kind? What should we have? Uh, and the second question comes out of, Michael, what you said. You, you talked about incentives available to the elite, but not available to the middle class and the working class. That really, from the debates I take part in, listen to in the House of Lords, that struck a note. And you talked about incentives regarding intergenerational equity between the elderly and the young. And uh, let me start with you, and then others come back. Uh, what sort of changed incentives would you like to see to address those issues? Well, I'm a, a politician who generally supports a capitalist system. But governments govern from the center. And in governing from the center, uh, you cannot just govern for one sector of society. And when I'm talking about uh, a small elite being over-incentivized, I'm really saying that the rewards available now uh, to the people who, who, who run affairs uh, in capitalism uh, are much, proportionately much greater than they were even 10 years ago, right. and certainly more than 20 years ago. As, and as the gap widens, it's harder to hold the center ground. And the center ground, hard-working middle-class people, if I'll use that phrase, are also threatened from below uh, because there's a pullback on their wages from the high levels of unemployment from people who can't get work. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the political model. And if the center doesn't hold, extremes take yes. over. Yes. Now, I can see it again then, if you look at uh, youth unemployment across the European Union, if you look at particularly uh, in, in the southern periphery, and even in countries like Ireland, even though we're doing a, a very good repair job, you know, there are consequences. And I don't think it's sustainable uh, that 30, 40 percent of young people are unemployed and don't see the prospect yeah. of getting a job. And then uh, at the same time, within a kind of a, if you scope it as a generational thing, you know, retired people are quite well off across Europe at present. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the higher levels of, of, of their jobs before retirement, very highly incentivized, a lot of rewards. And uh, yet there's a whole cohort of very talented uh, young people who can't get on the first step of a capitalist society, which is to get a job. And I'm saying rather than working, as I was describing with the two anecdotes, rather than working a model where you wait for the crisis to hit before you react with solutions, let's see, can we foresee uh, the next development and bring forward solutions? And I think there's an onus on, on business and banking to do that as much as there is on the political side. But the centre must hold, uh, otherwise um, the, the future of Europe is very difficult. I'm, I'm going on too long, but if you look at what's happening in Europe, the first phase of a discontented electorate is they move from the government to the opposition. And in Europe they move from centre-right to centre-left, or centre-left to centre-right. In Spain it went from left to right, in France it went from right to left. So there is no yet movement either to the right or to the left. But the next phase of it is, if the alternative government doesn't work and the problems remain, people seek extremes. And you can see the extremes developing already right across Europe. There's quite significant extreme movements, both on the right and on the left. So to hold the centre, we have to identify the emerging crisis issues mm -hmm. and address them before the crisis hits. Yeah. Uh, Larry, uh, on regulation? Sure. For, uh, I agree with much of what Michael said related to uh, society's needs and 
and, and the key with the young versus elderly. And I will tell you almost everything we see out of, I would say, out of austerity plans is to empower the elderly, making sure that they get their benefits, all the taxes on the young. So, I mean, I haven't seen any governmental change to change that, Michael. Um, on regulation, it is a mess. I'm trying to be generous. <laughs> um, I don't see actually coordinated regulation in Europe. I actually feel Europe is now becoming more fragmented. I believe how governments are responding to each bank's, country's banks, is differentiated. Uh, we are the largest investor of equities in the world. We own 5% of 2,600 companies. We are the largest hold holder of bank equities and the largest holder of bank debt. And we have to analyze every bank individually and have to look at banks differently for each government. I do not see a unified response. Some countries are a little more liberal in terms of doing bank stress tests than other banks. There is no there is no consistent manner in which bank resolution will be applied. In fact, we have seen or we've witnessed countries firewalling the liability, uh, the assets and the liabilities of subsidiary banks in different countries. You actually have now the U.S. Federal Reserve talking about another firewall uh, of the subsidiary banks in the United States. So. I would say what's going on now, using Michael's analogy, I think the pendulum has swung way too far, and yet there is still a lot more room for, re for restabilizing the banking system. So I, I, so I see these knee-jerk reactions. I see uh, governments protecting their own country. There is no coordinated effort. Um, uh, and importantly, um, I see no process of resolving this at the moment. I see a lot of words, um, and I have been personally quite critical to many regulators personally, and sometimes publicly. <laughs> but there is a need for better global coordinated regulation. Wow. I will tell you at BlackRock, um, uh, for those, who, um, we're at a business school, but we were at a law school, this would be a great statement. We are gonna probably hire another 300 lawyers and I'm not the source of being regulated because we're not a bank. And yet, the, uh, the interaction and the, uh, the issues that we have to address today, um, I would love to tell you that they, were, they, were, they are effective and workable for a better solution. Mm -hmm. I do believe to make markets better, we need markets to be more regulated. I do believe markets need to be much more transparent. I would like to see all transactions trade on exchanges, which would be very hostile to the banking system because they make money on the over-the-counter of the market. Um, so there are many things we could do to, um, to make the markets feel more fair. Mm. And if we did that, we would probably have more engagement. Uh, but I'm rambling now, but yes, it is a mess. And we are trying to constructively work with our regulators worldwide. Thank you very much, Luke. Glad to hear that BlackRock is hiring lawyers. So as courage is not always <laughs> rewarded in politics, so I can uh, apply for a job I at think BlackRock. A <laughs> <laughs> On regulation, Lord Lucas, <coughs> I think that the first priority should always be self-regulation. Mm. I think that is largely underestimated. The power that self-regulatory charters and bodies uh, can have. So I always insist in my country, talking to, to the bankers, talking to um, the leaders of the business community, that they should first and foremost establish their own system of values, which they should apply, and that already prevents governments from intervening too much. So I think that's extremely important, especially uh, to take into account the third party dimension, damages to third parties that some business behavior can entail. Our role as governments then is to make sure that excessive uh, behavior are somewhat regulated. And I agree with uh, Larry that it's very difficult sometimes to find the right uh, uh, balance. Um, I was minister uh, in charge of uh, 
of public security after 2001. And we had the same discussions in Europe, how strict should be the um, safety regulations when you board a plane. It was the same discussion. We were reacting to a dramatic event, and we had to find a solution. Here in financial services, and uh, Michael and I, we are dealing with this um, on, a, on an almost daily basis, we have to find the right balance. But where I agree with you, Larry, is that we have to take into account what I call the level playing field. We have to do this not on a national basis, but more on a European and even better on an international basis. So we have to find the right fora for that. But I think that we still have a long way to go there. If I look at discussion about banking union, what we are in the process of establishing is a single supervisory mechanism. But I see very little enthusiasm about the European Resolution Fund. And I think the two things go uh, together. Mm. And that is again because politics is local and short term. Because some have difficulties in defending in their own parliament and in front of their own public opinion, which is also local, that there is an interconnectedness which is much stronger than it used to be. And one last comment to what um, Larry said in his first uh, intervention. Failures and bankruptcies are part of um, capitalism. But in the financial system, somebody has to pay the bill if we want to ensure that the system remains, uh, keeps elements of trust and confidence. And that is a discussion that we had, for instance, when, it, when we discussed the rescue of, the, um, of uh, Cyprus and of the uh, Cypriot uh, banking system. They were not, these were not systemic banks in the classical sense. But if we would not have intervened, the risk would have been high that if we would have applied the normal rules of capitalism, that the trust in the financial system in Europe in general would have been again destroyed, and that's why we intervened. And therefore, there is, next to the protection of society, which you mentioned, also a dimension in the crisis of making sure that stability and confidence is restored, and therefore, for some time to come, we probably have to limit some of the logical consequences of the normal uh, elements of capitalism in order to make sure that st stability and confidence in the financial system is uh, restored for uh, the future. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now over to you. Time has gone on, and what I'm going to do is to ask for three, or at most four questions, and then ask each member of the panel to comment on them, starting with Mr. Ali Babakan. So who would like to ask the first question? Lady here uh, near the front. Could we have a microphone, please, to the lady? Maybe the lady could stand up. Thank you very much. I'm Barbara Judge, and I used to be a commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission in America, but I now work for the British government as chairman of the Pension Protection Fund. So first, my comment about Larry Fink's statement about risk and the differences about risk. In America, risk is rewarded. Failure is encouraged, is at least not, it's not, it's acceptable. If people fail, they can get financing again and they're rewarded for their risk taking. In Britain, where I live, risk is unacceptable. Government is risk averse and they're having a hard time finding the path to growth. Is this the way it ought to be, and how do we encourage governments in Europe, which are, sustain which are doing a lot of thinking about how to grow, to look at the risk-reward relationship? And Turkey is a country which has taken a lot of risk, responsible risk, as we heard from Ali Babakan. Can you talk about, Mr. Babakan, Her Your Excellency, the moves to creating an international financial center in Turkey, and how that risk-taking will benefit Turkey and the region, and how you see the risk that you're taking in Turkey benefit your country. Thank you very much, Lady Judge. Next question. A, a lady there, uh, sitting next to the aisle, wearing glasses, I think. Hi, my name's Anika. I'm here from the US. I'm part of the Future Leaders Group. Um, Mr. Noonan, you mentioned uh, that the, the uncertain future that young people face despite their talents. I'd like to know the panel's view on the actions that young people can take individually and collectively to better secure their futures. Excellent question. Gentlemen here, a microphone to 
gentleman wearing a very dark shirt, recognizable with all the white shirts around, I think, <laughs> because of that, but a big smile. Good morning. My name is Carl Caramon. I'm uh, from Canada, also uh, a student. My question uh, to all panelists, uh, probably better directed to the policymakers, the politicians, is how to deal with uh, the double standard of global capitalism in context of international trade. Uh, it often happens that industrial countries are the preachers of capitalism, uh, free markets, open markets. However, in the same time, they're the biggest protectors of their agricultural industry, uh, which really blocks out developing nations to compete. So what, what incentives do industrial nations provide for developing countries to participate in the global capitalist society? Thank you. Excellent question. Could we, I feel like somebody going on a journey looking at the horizon, but is there someone further back who I haven't seen so far? There's somebody right at the back there with a white sleeve. I don't know if it's a man or a woman, but <laughs> whoever it is, ask your question. <laughs> Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, let me try and stand up. Thank you. Ha has the individual disappeared or what? No. <laughs> um, my question, my question is directed. What, what's the name? Oh, my name is Ayanda Meiwa. I'm from South Africa. I'm part of the Leaders of Tomorrow team. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. Luke Frieden and also to the panelists uh, at large. Um, Sir, you said that failures and bank crises are part of capitalism. But in the financial sector, someone has to pay the bills. And had we not intervened, the risks would have been higher and trust in the, um, in the financial system would have been lost. Now, it appears to me that you're saying that in a very casual manner as if it's something that is completely acceptable. But the question is, for how long should we accept that failures and bank crises are just part of the system. For how long, as we have seen that, crisis after crisis are becoming severe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask, starting with Mr. Ali Babakin and going again uh, clockwise, if I may, to comment on either one, hopefully not all, because we don't have the time, but on what you think was the key question for you. So, Ali. Well, uh, first of all, let me talk about the, the, the banking policies, regulation overall. I think it's very important to do this in a coherent way with the fiscal and monetary policies. And it's very important to implement this in a, a counter-cyclical way, so that in good times, ask the banks to uh, accumulate reserves, and during the bad times, just relax the policy a little bit so that it doesn't just compound the effect of the, uh, of the crisis. And also, there is a, another wave of populism continuing around this area, because some, in some countries, I'm following that governments are blaming the financial sector for all what has been going wrong and asking for the banks to pay it through either financial transition tax, uh, transaction tax, or working on the payments for the bank uh, managers and, and, and so forth. And I think uh, it's very important uh, to do these in a preemptive way, in a proactive way, before the glass is broken, basically. So squeeze it during the good times, but relax it during bad times. I think it's very important when we talk about the banking system. For Istanbul as a financial center, which was a question directly asked to me, uh, first of all, trust is at the core of this project. And that's why we have been legislating brand new frameworks, legal frameworks for trade overall, for uh, obligations, a brand new capital markets law, a specialized courts in finance, <coughs> so that whenever there are disputes, those disputes can be solved in a fast and reliable way. Logistics play a key role, and also human resources. I think human resources is at the core of, again, a good international financial system. And just maybe one uh, last word about protectionism. Again, this is another wave of populism now uh, in many, many uh, countries. It is very easy 
for politicians to blame externalities for whatever what's going on wrong in their own country. Sometimes it is the immigrant workers to blame. Sometimes it is the imported products to blame. But I think every country has already a huge homework to do list to do much better in many, many areas. And whenever there is protectionism in a country, the people who are hurt are actually the citizens themselves. Because the protectionism actually makes the consumers to have access to higher price goods and lower quality goods. Whenever we talk about open trade, it's not just good for social purposes, but it's also important for the consumers to have access. And then when we talk about, again, consumers, I think protecting consumers uh, in the area of the financial sector is also a very important aspect. Because ordinary citizens may not be aware of the details of, uh, or, or the, the very uh, complicated aspects of finance. And uh, that's why, for example, in Turkey, when we talk about consumer credits, we do it only in lira, our local currency, and we do it only in fixed rate. For example, for mortgages, we ask for 25% down payment requirements for mortgages. Because if there are no such protective rules for the consumers, the pure competition between the banks are actually creating a group of victims at the end uh, who are not simply being able to fulfill their, uh, their obligations. So timely regulation, protecting the consumer, especially against the, 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 the uh, subjects of the financial sector, is also another important aspect in this whole picture. I have to ask the next three panelists who took part in the panel discussion with Mr. Aliban to be very brief, if I can, but starting with Michael. Well, Barbara, Judge's question, first of all, I think there are legal and cultural uh, attitudes to the treatment of risk and how one can start again. So on the legal side, I think, uh, right across Europe, there has to be change in bankruptcy and insolvency laws. Uh, so that people can move out of bankruptcy and insolvency and get into a fresh start situation in a much shorter period of, period of time. Uh, cultural things are individual to each country and uh, you know, they're not as easily addressed. On the question uh, about young people, I think that the first approach uh, has to be on the theory that a rising tide lifts all boats. So if we can get Europe, for example, to have a policy which is more growth and jobs friendly, the young people will get their share of that. And then there are specific interventions uh, which are worth following as well. And if we could look at best practice in each country, three of them come to mind. Chancellor Merkel about three weeks ago uh, talked about uh, the possibility of early retirement on pension on condition that young people would get the job vacated by the retiree. A uh, second proposal came up last night when the uh, German foreign minister uh, talked about uh, the uh, Swiss and German model for apprenticeship uh, being a model uh, that might uh, work uh, to get young people back to work because the conversion rates from apprenticeship to uh, being employed in the company were very, very high. And in Ireland, we, we're running an internship program at the moment. It's geared towards graduates, but it's very successful. Uh, what we do is uh, they're hired by an employer. They get welfare payments plus a small supplement, typically about 50 euros a week. But the conversion rate is very high. And because they're given that couple of months to prove themselves, uh, they're being hired. Very high percentages are converting from the program into jobs. So I think if we examine best practice across and pick the better ones and target youth unemployment, that's the way I would see it going forward. Lud. Thank you. Very briefly on two issues. Uh, on the young people, there, are, there is, of course, the government action, but there's also action by the young people themselves. And I would uh, say that one is education is the key to success, training and education. Two. I think you have to, as a young person, and also thereafter, to accept competition and to strive for excellence. And the third is study and work abroad. Because if we talk about global capital capitalism, you need to be part of this global capitalism. You need to go to the places where there is growth, you get a broader horizon, and you can benefit uh, 
of many of the uh, positive aspects of globalization. On the question from a um, uh, South African uh, person regarding uh, bankruptcy in the financial system, I think, of course, our task is first to prevent bankruptcy and failures through a better supervision and to um, reasonable, I say, a reasonable uh, global regulation, capital requirements, uh, and so on and so forth. And then I would add one sentence. We don't find it normal for governments to save banks, as people say. But in fact, what we are doing, we are not saving banks. We are making sure that there's no huge economic and social damage to society if the clients of the banks, that is all of us, the companies, the people, would lose all of their money and would lose the trust in the financial institutions which are so necessary for our economies to function. So that's why we are intervening. That's not the normal thing we should do, but which is necessary to keep social cohesion and to keep our economies uh, running. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Larry. I'll just be brief. I think um, there's two words that come to mind that will, that will transform Europe, North America, and that's called trust and confidence. There's just a lack of that. Um, I have to remind everybody every time I talk to people, the average CEO in the world has a term of five years. So that pharmaceutical CEO just became there. When they create that molecule, they're not going to be there if it's successful. It'll be the CEO after most probably. And, um, and because there's a lack of trust and confidence today, most we see this investors worldwide freezing, keeping much of their money in short-term bonds and cash. But we also see one very relative behavior by businesses, the huge pool of cash sitting on the sideline. Mm -hmm. In the United States alone, corporations are sitting with $1.8 trillion in cash. And a lot of politicians have asked me, why are the equity markets doing so well and yet society is doing so poorly? Well, because there's a lack of trust and confidence, the CEOs have to find one way to reward their shareholders and they are buying back their shares in record levels, which really has a only a modest impact in society. Certainly has a very modest impact in job creation. Um, and, and, and so what we, we need to focus on how to rebuild confidence in, in the system, mm. confidence that it it makes sense for he or she who's running a company that what they're doing is not only good um, for, um, for their employees and their shareholders, but it's a great thing for society. And I think we forgot that. I really do believe government and business have forgotten that connectivity. It's all about growth. And for all the young people who are looking for jobs, this is what you need to be demanding. How can business and how can business and government find productive policies to create jobs, to create private sector jobs? Because the problem we're going to face in North America and Europe, we are going to shrink the federal jobs. That is just what's happening when we call austerity. So if you continue to see the public sector jobs decreasing, you have to rely more on the private sector. And if we do not create that trust and confidence and partnership between government and the private sector, uh, we're going to have real unstable, uncertainty and instability because of lack of job creation. One, one just very brief, because we... Just uh, uh, very, very brief, just a short anecdote about risk and courage. When, the, when our airlines first started to fly to Mogadishu, the airport was listed as terminally closed. <laughs> and now there are daily flights, a great country to do business. Thank you. It's time. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to wrap up this session. I take away two words, expressions from it. The first is capitalism is about, and the market economy, it's about freedom, it's about enterprise, it's about free enterprise. It's about taking risk. And without taking risk, our capitalist systems are going to die. But secondly, alongside that, 
Michael Noonan's phrase, I think, from the poet Yeats, the center has to hold. And I think tackling our problems is not just an issue of re-engineering. It's an issue of our culture and our values. And although I believe in freedom and inequality of outcome, I think what we need in the Western world is a new vision of the equality of people created in the image of God with human dignity and tremendous potential and the challenge, and I don't think governments are doing enough, how do we unleash the creative possibilities for younger people today? That, to me, is the number one lesson I take away from this. Can we give a big hand of applause to the panel? <laughs>